This session is about seismic and dynamic considerations in a slope W stability analysis. In this session, I'm going to introduce you to two approaches. One is the pseudo-static approach, pseudo-static, and the other one is using dynamic finite element results from quake and slope. The simplest way of considering dynamic or seismic effects in a stability analysis is to use what is known as the pseudo-static approach. Basically, what you do is you specify some kind of a earthquake or shaking coefficient, kh or kv. And then a portion of the slice weight is applied as a horizontal force at the slice centroid. So the force is equal to kW times the weight. The coefficient is the same as saying that it is some peak ground acceleration as a function of g. You can specify a coefficient for the horizontal direction or for the vertical direction, or you can do it for both. So the key parameter that needs to be defined in slope are these coefficients. If you do this type of an analysis, and then you go to view slice force information, you will see these forces that are at the center of the slice. These represent the dynamic force. And these forces are pointed in the direction of the movement. If you go to the key in seismic key and seismic load dialog box, you can enter here K, H, and K, V. They are simple constants for the slope. There is another checkbox here. It says ignore seismic load in base shear strength calculations. And basically this is an attempt to simulate undrained behavior. So if you have a slope and a slip surface, then slope W, before you apply the seismic pseudo static seismic load, determines the shear strength S at the base of the slice. Then once the shear strength has been known, the shear strength is held constant. And then, after the shear strength has been known, then the pseudo-static seismic loads are applied and the process is repeated. So, again, to exercise that option, you need to check this box here. And all of this is in an attempt to simulate undrained behavior. The thinking is that the earthquake load is applied so quickly that the soil will behave in an undrained manner and that the strength will not change during the shaking. When you use pseudostatic forces, it is easy to apply a KH that is too big, and usually this manifests itself in lack of convergence. So to overcome the problem, sometimes it's necessary to ask the question, what is the KH that gives me a factor of safety of 1? And so let us assume that a coefficient of 0 0.3 does not allow you to achieve convergence. Then the procedure is to 
select smaller values, decimal 0, 05, decimal 1, decimal 1, 5, and so forth, until you reach a factor of safety of 1. The thinking is that any value greater than the KH that gives you 1 is representative of field failure anyway, so there is no sense in analyzing the case when K the KH is too big. So to control this and know what is going on, we often recommend that you make a hand sketch of a drawing, something like this. When KH is zero, under static condition, there might be a factor of safety. Then you apply a small KH and you get a lower factor of safety. Then you s apply a little bit of a bigger KH and you'll get a lower factor of safety. Then apply a little bit of bigger H and you get another lower factor of safety. And eventually you get a another KH that gives you a factor of safety less than one. And then you determine what is the KH that gives you a factor of safety of one. Some, so to repeat, to simply dump in a KH that is too big, you may not get a realistic solution. And the approach to overcoming this problem is to sketch a diagram like this and try various KH values to g see how the factor of safety reduces as the KH increases. Using the pseudo-static approach in slope W is obviously very straightforward. The biggest difficulty is of defining a value that is too big. But the biggest problem with this method is knowing what coefficient you should apply. And obviously, we cannot give you any guidance on this because this is site and project specific. In the end, if you have too much difficulty finding an appropriate value on your own, you may want to talk to a seismologist or somebody who has experience with this method. The second stage in complexity of considering seismic and dynamic forces is to use quake results in slope W. Before we open the file, we will just look at the highlights in this PowerPoint presentation. It is clearly evident that when a slope like this is subjected to an earthquake, that there are moments, split seconds, when the motion will be in the direction of the slope, destabilizing the slope. At other split seconds, the motion may be in this direction, which in actual fact may increase the factor of safety of the slope. So the idea is to look at what is the factor of safety during the earthquake shaking, and we can get that once we know the quake results. One of the key input parameters in a quake W analysis is that you need to have some time history record from an earthquake. We need to know the acceleration versus time. And uh, there are public records of such earthquake records, but once again, if you get into this area of study and want to use this type of an analysis, you may have to talk to seismologists in your area that can help you produce one of these time history records or find one that is appropriate for your site. I won't go any further details here on how you can manipulate this curve and where you can get it except to note that it is a key piece of information that needs to be supplied for a quake W analysis. Once the quake W results are available, we can use them in slope W. And this is the type of graph that is obtainable. For each time that we save the results, we can use the quake results in slope and determine a factor of safety. And as a result, you see you get something like this, where the 
factor of safety obviously sometimes is very high, but other times the factor of safety is quite low. And there are moments in time when the factor in safety even falls below one. And we can use this information to do what is known as a Newmark analysis. Fundamentally, to those of you who are not familiar with a Newmark analysis, a Newmark analysis attempts to integrate the displacements that occur during the split seconds when the factor of safety is less than one. And we have implemented this procedure in slope W. So the first thing that slope W does, it needs to find what is the average acceleration that would make the factor of safety a one. And so slope W produces this graph and then says at a factor of safety of one, what is the average acceleration? This is known as the yield acceleration. In this case, the yield acceleration is decimal 055, decimal 06, something like this. If we, all else being equal, if we were to take a pseudostatic kh value and put it into slope w of approximately decimal 055, and for the same slip surfaces, we should get a factor of safety approximately one. In other words, what is the average acceleration for the potential sliding mass that will make the factor of safety one? Knowing what the yield acceleration is, we can then go to a graph such as this that gives the average acceleration versus time. And knowing that the yield acceleration is some value close to 0 0.5, for example, we can integrate the area under this curve. And we can integrate all of these areas where the yield acceleration has been greater, or the average acceleration rather has been greater than the yield acceleration. Having completed that integration, we get a velocity versus time curve. Then the next step is to determine the area under the velocity versus time curve. And when we do that integration, we get a dis permanent displacement versus time graph, something like this. The thinking is that when the velocity is greater than zero, there will be split seconds when there will be movement, and the accumulation of that movement is, will manifest itself in permanent deformation. An observation of this Newmark method, let's go back several slides to this particular slide here. And the Newmark method says there will only be permanent deformation if the factor of safety drops below one sometime during the shaking. If at all times the factor of safety never drops below one during the shaking, then the Newmark method says there will be no permanent deformation. So in many times when there is no deformation versus time graph, it likely means that at no time during the shaking does the factor of safety drop below one. The other point is that for the factor of safety to drop below one during the shaking, often it means that the factor of safety under static conditions is quite low. If the factor of safety under static conditions is quite high, then it often means that the factor of safety does not drop below one during the shaking and uh, consequently the Newmark method says that there will be no permanent deformation. Nonetheless, it does give you an appreciation for how the stability changes during the earthquake shaking. 
The method is more about looking at what will be the permanent deformation than it is about designing to a particular factor of safety. Jumping back forward then to where we were, a few comments on the Newmark method very quickly here. The Newmark method is only suitable when the soil does not lose a lot of strength during the shaking. And secondly, there is little or no development of excess pore pressure during the shaking. These conditions might occur in hard rock slopes or clay slopes or embankments where the soil behaves in an undrained manner. It's just necessary to realize that the Newmark method cannot be used in all cases. More particularly, the Newmark method is not appropriate if there are situations where there is the possibility of liquefaction, the generation of a lot of excess pore pressure, which might lead to a sudden loss in shear strength of the soil. So the Newmark method is useful but in only in selected cases. Obviously this method will be discussed more in the Quake workshop session. So that ends our session on seismic and, and dynamic forests in slope W. It is obviously a very uh, rapid overview of the situation but adequate for this workshop purposes. So that ends the session on this topic.